hi everyone. This is uh, the third for this year, third monthly meetup. And this time I've actually written some notes, so I try and remember things that are worth saying. Um, yeah, uh, so there's an agenda list over at the um, over at the wiki. If anyone wants to add anything on the agenda for later on. And I honestly you say that you've got some people lined up to make sure we get some recordings. That's really good. Um, I'll just run through very briefly what OSR is because there's usually a, let's see, are there some new people here today? Yeah, it does look like it. There's some new people. So I'll just quickly um, show you what OSR is. And today I'm a little bit confused, so I'll just take it gently. Yes, see now it's not sharing. Ah, oh, sorry. I said I was a bit confused. There we go. So that's the uh, the osarc.org website. Um, and just basically, as it says there, we're working to create a built environment with free software, more transparency, and a more ethical approach. Um, all sorts of people come and get involved if you want to talk about what we're doing. Um, further down on the front page here, there are some news stories so you can see what's going on. Um, and you can subscribe here and you'll then get a notification when there are new events or new stories. And I don't know why that picture is orange. It was fine just a few moments ago. Um, and there's a calendar. And there's this wiki. This is where you find our software list and all sorts of other exciting things. Uh, if you like what you're doing and, and want to say that you're involved and want to let people know that you support us, there's a page here where you can go in and add yourself as an advocate or a contributor or whatever. And um, building that page out is really great because it lets us know who really wants to get involved. And we've got a pretty active chat forum, sorry, pretty active forum. Uh, lots of stuff there. Get involved if that sounds interesting for you. And there's a live chat, the, the link on the website that goes directly to, to this system here. But if you've got an account, of course, on IRC or in metrics, then uh, you can log into that. I think that's all I needed to say about that. Um, other than that, let me just there we go. So these videos, uh, they get recorded. They'll be shared under a Creative Commons license publicly. So if you're uncomfortable with that, uh, keep your camera turned off and change your name. Um, yeah, that's basically that. And at the end of the, at the end of Gonzalo's presentation, we'll we'll stop the recording and we'll start a new one and just have a general discussion about some different topics. Uh, the topics that are on the agenda on the wiki and whatever else people feel like talking about. Um, I'd, I'd like to try something new. If somebody would be willing to just take some notes and share them with us on the forum afterwards, then we can write a little uh, a little article to share or just, you know, a short piece to share on Twitter and LinkedIn, thanking um, Gonzalo for, for showing us Compass and letting people know what it is. Is anybody going to put their hand up to write some notes about what we go through today? It's not going to happen today. Ryan is have his can, hand up. I can do that, but I don't know how to raise oh, my hand. Cool, Ryan. Thanks for that. Um, that is it's. And you've got a picture, Gonzalo, to put on. Yeah, um, when you're asking questions or if you've got something to say, it'd be really great if you turn on your camera at the same time. It creates a bit more of a community atmosphere instead of a whole lot of colored circles all over the screen, which gets a bit tiring after a while. Mm -hmm. That's it. Do you want to? So, um, 
Gonzalo, if you want to uh, control the screen so you've got your nice picture on the screen. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so Gonzalo is going to present uh, the Compass platform to us, and I'll let him say what it's about. Um, Ionis, have we got some people running recordings? Yes, yes, we are good to go. Great. Great. Gonzalo, go for mm -hmm. it. Thank you very much. Uh, do you see my my screen in big now, or is it still the little one? I think we have to click on it to make it big. Um, I don't think I can force it to be big. So people find the, the screen with the black where it says compass, and that'll make it full screen when you click on it. All right, good, OK. Then, uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here tonight. Um, my name is Gonzalo. I'm, I'm a software engineer, not, not an architect. Um, I work in Gramatio Color Research uh, at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. Uh, that's the uh, uh, University of Technology in Switzerland. Um, and I'm part of a team that is, um, is running on a program called NCCR Digital Fabrication, National Center for Competence in Research for Digital Fabrication. It's, um, it's a 12 year program and, um, that funds research on, on architecture or digital fabrication. So uh, in that context, we've been working uh, for several years now on a project and it recently hit version 1.0, which is just a, an excuse to say, okay, this is this is stable state, status after a long time. Um, we promise to keep this API stable, but the work continues, of course. Uh, the project is called Compass, as you see on the screen. And in short, it's an open source framework in Python uh, built for uh, architecture, engineering, and construction. And for a bit of context about what we do, like in particular, the team I work on has like a decade long of experience in robotic fabrication. Um, we cross multiple technologies, material systems, and scales. Uh, we do, we may, mostly we leverage the capabilities of industrial robots because the robotic arm allows us to kind of precisely place and orient things in space. And we can automate it, we can repeat it, we can parameterize it, customize it, or make it dependent on sensory inputs during fabrication. So this, this opens up the um, architect's design freedom quite significantly because it allows to build non-standard elements in, and structures at the same cost that a, that a standard one. Um, the research topics are like uh, additive manufacturing, uh, formative, subtractive material processes. Um, but the, the common topic here, and it is also one of the two key points that drives the development of Compass Framework, uh, is the, one of them is enabling computational or parametric design. Uh, which is like in a design process in which the geometry is not drawn, but it's it's coded, it's programmed based on rules and parameters and so on to allow exploring different options. The, the nice thing about that is not just to be able to generate multiple options uh, quickly, but it is uh, the fact that we can embed semantic information into these models. And the semantic information can be like either structural behavior, fabrication constraints, and whatnot. So it, this breaches the design to the fabrication step uh, kind of very directly. And taking it one step further, uh, we can feed back into the model the sensor, sensor input from the world during fabrication and then adapt as, as needed. Um, all of this requires the involvement of multiple di disciplines, like this building something like this requires like, structural engineers and material scientists and, and computer science people and robotics and, and whatnot. So the second point that drives um, the development of Compass is support of 
interdisciplinarity. So that somewhat uh, means uh, data exchange across platforms and knowledge transfer across teams, and also um, uh, knowledge transfer from academia to industry. Right? And I know this last point of data exchange sounds a little bit like we could be creating a new standard for exchange, but rest assured that we are very well aware of this joke. So uh, we're, we are not trying to create a new standard. We're um, trying to breach exi existing technologies. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. And we also don't want uh, research teams in, in, in our context and also outside to keep reinventing solutions for the same thing. So we're, we're trying to breach technology from um, from the different disciplines that has, that is as uh, like state of the art as, as it gets and it's usually not really intended for the use cases that we that we have so that's the that's the breaching uh, part of what we do so compass can be seen as an ecosystem or like ecosystem of packages. Uh, there is a code library and there's a growing collection of uh, additional packages that extend the core functionality into domain specific knowledge, you could say. So there is a next to core, there is things like Fabric, Fab, Compass Fab, which is uh, robotic fabrication that connects to tools like ROS, the robotic operating system. Um, and then there is a um, yeah, RVE for rigid body equilibrium, FEA, and a bunch of other um, packages that do um, domain-specific um, features. The, this diagram highlights why one central decision, design decision of the framework, and is uh, features of the framework are to be uh, agnostic of the underlying technologies, both on the backend side and on the front end side. So the whole framework is CAD agnostic. And I'll show some examples about um, doing the same thing in, in, in different um, environments. So this, this basically helps uh, researchers in our teams write code focusing on the core of the research, pro research project instead of keeping uh, solving the accidental complexity that comes with integrating front end and back end stuff. The, the core of, uh, of Compass is um, a cross platform Python framework. Um, cross platform is highlighted here because uh, a lot of our researchers use uh, Rhino. And Rhino doesn't really have Python, it has an Iron Python um, thing that runs inside .NET, which really doesn't qualify as Python mostly. <laughs> um, but we we write like compatible code that runs on both on C Python and on Iron Python. And, and then the framework and most of the packages, uh, except some that depend on libraries that are more copyleft, uh, but most of the packages are licensed as MIT um, to, yeah, yeah, because it's a li very liberal open source license. A lot of effort uh, is put into making it easy to get started with this thing, because the, we know that the the users that might uh, benefit from the framework, they come from very different um, backgrounds. Some of them have very proficient coding skills. Others are just starting. Others prefer visual programming. Um, so we, we make an effort to make it easy to use, make it easy to install, also to be a good citizen in the open source uh, ecosystem. So we publish these things over Conda, for instance. Besides uh, the, the Python index, uh, all of the packages are available on Conda to simplify the installation because um, many of our users are on Windows and getting things to install on Windows is not always uh, the easiest. 
the, then uh, like for features that the, that the core library provides, there are three main areas of features that are provided. One is uh, geometry, like primitive shapes and so on. Then there's a bunch of data structures that are very flexible. I will talk about this a bit more in detail later. And then there is a basic robots um, support. Basic because the the more detailed one is in the, in the specific packages. But you might still be wondering what is Py, uh, what is Compass in the end? And at its most basic level, Compass is a standalone library, Python library, that you can use to do geometry processing even on the command line if you want. So this is, we just launch Python um, REPL and load a mesh and well, this one is not doing anything interesting, but you can you can use everything without the CAD. But that's not how many of our users use it. You, usually people want a visual output. There's a standalone viewers with the library, but there's also CAD integrations. So this is Rhino on Windows. There is Blender uh, support as well. And um, I mentioned that we want to kind of um, simplify life for people using this so that they don't have to worry about the CAD that they will use. So the, the concept, uh, the concepts in general are isolated and then um, abstracted, let's say. And then once you want to use it, you import the concept that you're using from the specific package that you are uh, into. So in the, in the case of showing something on a CAD or any kind of a design environment, uh, the concept that we use is this of artists. And we have this artist components for almost every object in the framework. And depending on where you import, like which is in the top level namespace or package that you import the artist from, you'll get the correct results based on the on the environment you are in. So this is two simple examples of how to draw a mesh on Rhino and Blender. And they are identical except um, except the line where we import from Compass Rhino or from Compass Blender. Um, about, well, yeah, well, this is a bit boring. Doing basic stuff and built-in objects for performance reasons. So you can, you don't need to construct, very often you don't need to construct a class uh, for the simple types because a, a sequence will be evaluated as the same. So a, a, a list or in any kind of enumerable of three items will be considered a point in the right context and so on for most of them. The primitives and shapes, uh, I think there's nothing very crazy here. Perhaps to highlight it is that there is an entire uh, transformations um, support in pure Python, uh, but also um, it can use NumPy if you if you use if you have it and you want to use it for performance. Um, and again, if you're like it, we try to optimize depending on the context. So for the heaviest transformations. If you are on Rhino, for instance, you would get the Rhino transforms natively instead of being of using Python transforms that would be very slow. Uh, in terms of data structures, I'll mention two main ones. That's the mesh data structure, of course. And the main characteristic of it is that it's CAD agnostic, so you can use the mesh without a front end. It's a half edge data structure. It supports and sided polygonal faces. Um, and this thing about custom attributes is a constant across the framework. Uh, most of the things can be annotated at multiple levels. Uh, so the mesh is one, the network is the other one that also supports um, uh, 
custom annotations everywhere. And the network is basically a, a graph. It's a directed edge graph. Um, there are kind of two different um, implementations. Uh, one inherits from the other one. There is a graph that is purely topological, and there's a network that it's a geometric Im implementation of a graph. Um, it also has network X support. If you want to go back and forth, this should be lossless. So you can, and network X has more algorithms included than, than what Compass has, for instance. So you can do things in Compass, go to a network X, do some, uh, some calculations, go back to Compass. And the other thing that I want to mention today is the robot model. Um, robot model serves, serves as a basic representation of robots uh, for other packages to leverage and do things with it. Um, a robot model is a tree structure. It's um, a tree structure and there's a typo here. It's off links and joints. <laughs> uh, it supports forward kinematics in the core library um, and every other functionality is from an extended package. It's built on URDF. So in case you're not familiar with it, URDF is, um, is a format for robot description that it's basically a de facto standard coming from, from, from an open source project called uh, Robot Operating System. And yeah, like mostly everyone uses this to define a robot. And as I mentioned, this is the foundation for robotic packages. Another interesting feature that Compass has is um, rem remote procedure calls. This is mainly driven by the fact that Rhino runs this um, crippled version of Python. So like a lot of things, in particular NumPy and all its data processing friends are not available. So uh, RPC, remote procedure calls, is a mechanism in Compass that allows you to call functions uh, that use uh, C Python stuff from within an environment that actually doesn't allow you to do it natively. So it's C Python and Rhino in, in a sentence. Uh, besides that, there's a bunch of algorithms um, that for 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 topology like traversing graphs and networks and stuff, linearity checking, numerical algorithms for force density or dynamic relaxation, um, remeshing and whatnot. Now uh, that's like the the core library, but a lot of functionality comes from additional packages. Um, this one, for example, uh, these ones that we see here are sort of grouped in a, in a toolbox for digital fabrication. Um, one, the first one is uh, Compass Fab, which is for robotic fabrication, specifically for planning and execution of uh, robotic fabrication processes. This is, in fact, the, where most of my days are spent. I, I work on the team that works mostly on this package. Uh, and also the next one, RRC is a is a basically a driver for ABB robots. And Compass Slicer is mesh slicing for, for um, FDM 3D print, printing. Uh, it's, it's not only a planner slicer, it's also a non-planner uh, slicer. There are other things like um, Compass Finite Element Analysis, which integrates other softwares, like Abacus, OpenSys, ANSYS. These ones, I am not super familiar with this uh, because this happens in a different team, but there's, uh, I know that there's an upcoming rewrite of it based on a, um, on a new architecture that's, uh, that's uh, coming out sometime later this year or next year, I don't know. Then like more packages, Compass Assembly to describe data um, discrete assemblies, discrete element assemblies, rigid body equilibrium, uh, topological interlocking. Yeah, there's a number of things. 
perhaps you are familiar with this uh, from BRG, from Block Research Group, Rhino Bolt uh, for designing funicular forms. The first version was written for Rhino, and uh, but it was written many years ago, and it was now rewritten based completely on Compass, so that the, the name stays, but actually you don't need Rhino. So it's now actually called Compass RV2. Uh, and then some, like, besides these packages that are kind of functionally focused, there are, there are plugins to extend uh, features within Compass. Um, this is done with a plugin system that uh, allows, allows the framework to choose the best implementation available based on the context. So, um, for example, if you have Compass Seagull installed, this, these packages are a case of um, non-MIT license packages because Seagull is uh, LGPL or GPL even. Triangle has a weird license that it's non-open non source compliant, but it's still non, not, a, not MIT licensable. And LibIGL has also a complicated situation with licensing where they have the copyleft stuff segregated and you can install with something like um, Apache or something like that, one of the liberal ones. If you don't want the copyleft stuff, but if you do, complicated. Anyway, these packages are adding features to uh, the core of Compass. Uh, for example, mm, Boolean operations is a case where we, we don't, we don't have re-implemented booleans in pure Python because that would be incredibly slow. So if you want booleans and you have Compass Seagull installed, you do a boolean operation and it will be calculated using Seagull. If you're in Rhino where Seagull doesn't run because it's a C Python library, uh, it will automatically choose to use the native um, Rhino boolean operations, boolean operations. And that's, that's the case with most of these features. This is something re relatively new. So we're growing the set of uh, features that get auto-selected this way. Now, um, I'm gonna focus a little bit on the DFAB, on the digital fabrication tool packages because that's uh, my, my core, um, core um, competence, let's say. Uh, this is, I don't know if you see the animation smooth enough, but uh, this is more or less um, what we, like, this is Compass Fab in action, showing Compass and Compass Fab in action, showing um, a, bit, a bit of everything in one go. What we have here is a, a robot model that was loaded from ROS, the robot operating system. It's building a brick wall in which each of the moves uh, has been path planned using Move It, which is the motion framework of ROS. Uh, and it's taking care of all the kinematic and the Cartesian planning. And it's also doing the collision checking. And everything is animated in Rhino for, for the comfort of the designer, let's say. Again, um, just to highlight, like Compass Fab follows the same the same principles, the same principles. So it's front end and back back end agnostic. We can load robots from ROS, but we can also load models, uh, uh, robot models directly from GitHub or from a local folder. So there's a bunch of different um, loaders for robots, and it's also CAD agnostic. So here we see the the same example that we had with the mesh, we have we have it with them um, with multiple meshes basically for a robot. Um, in on the right for Rhino on the sorry on the left for Rhino on the right for Blender, and the output is yeah the same robot render is the same in both uh, series. There's also um, like visual programming integration in Grasshopper, 
we don't yet have integration in uh, Shvel Chalk. I, I never know how to pronounce that right, uh, but we would love to. So this is, in general, the whole Blender support is relatively new. Uh, so we are, we are improving that. Uh, and hopefully soon we will have also uh, nodes for a shared shop. And in terms of robot backends, and I'm kind of getting to the end, towards the end of the presentation, in terms of robotic backends, uh, we support three main ones. One is uh, VREP, which is a robot simulator. It's, um, it's a, it was the first one that we integrated. It's a, it's a regular application, so it's uh, somewhat, let's say, simple to use. Um, then we integrated ROS, and ROS is a very, very big tool. Um, it's um, it's not only, it's funny because ROS is called Robot Operating System, but it's neither an operating system nor robot specific. <laughs> the, the core of ROS is just an inter-process communication tool. Um, it's a distributed system coordinator in a way, but it's used for robotics, so it's it's, uh, it's targeted for that. And there's a there's a number of uh, projects that run on it, such as Move It, which is a motion planner for ROS, and that's the that's the second big and currently our main focus for for robotic backends because it, of the of the fact that it's basically the, the de facto standard for robotics, uh, at least in the academic communities. So that's the second one we integrated. And recently we added support for PyBullet for like physics, and we are extending that support as we move on. Um, so I don't know if I would have uh, time to do a quick demo, if you agree, or otherwise I can just wrap it up like this. It's probably fine. If you only need five, 10 minutes, go for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, good. And then let's go for them. You will have to forgive me for using Rhino for the demo because, yeah, that's. <laughs> Um, I want to show something that it's actually, it's going to look hopefully very simple, but uh, it involves quite a bit of complexity. I want to, I want to more or less show the, the animation that we've seen, but quick. So, um, I'm going to start ROS with a robot. Since ROS is a Linux tool only, we need to run it with, uh, somewhere like a different way. So we run it with Docker. I'm going to launch here all my containers. This launches the multitude of things on my computer. Um, as soon as this one finishes. I'm going to show you quickly how the container looks like because we include Just while it's starting up there, can I ask a question? Of um, how many teams and how many developers are there? It sounds like a large project. So I'm kind of curious and about how it's organized and how large it is. Um, Compass Core uh, was started at Block Research Group by, it was organically started as, a, like a, as an internal effort to solve their needs. Uh, but it grew, and at some point we formed a, a small team of 
initially three, then four developers uh, working on it. Now we are four or five. Um, Compass Fab is, as, in a way, it's a subset of that group. Uh, we are three developers in there, but it's these three are also in the in the, uh, in the Compass Core team. So it's not it's not like we are eight or nine in total. Uh, so, um, but RRC, for example, the robot driver is something that uh, we do together with another, uh, with um, with a person from the robotics lab, uh, um, an expert in in ABB robots. Um, yeah, that's more or less a team. Then. Um, what we are aiming to do, because through all these years, the NCCR program is a funding scheme that lasts for 12 years. Uh, we are more or less in the, in the end of the second phase. That means that more or less eight years, I think seven actually uh, have passed. And now the focus for the next four or five years is going to be transfer into, into a community um, driven development or project. So the project is going to be transitioned outside the NCCR and as a, like set up as a, as a proper um, autonomous open source project. Um, okay, now I can show you here. Um, this is VNC or no, no VNC showing the content of the container in my browser. Uh, this is not really, like, not strictly necessary, but it's nice to show what we have there. And I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna connect from here. So I'm gonna drop this Rust Connect component. What I'm dropping here in components is also, all of it is possible to do with, um, with Python code. For the longest time, we didn't have this. This was actually released two or three weeks ago. So this is very new. Um, Other here, this thing is not connected. Of course, I connect. Now I'm connected to Rose. Uh, and I'm going to load the robot with this component. This will take a little bit. It will probably take a bit longer than usual because my computer slows down terribly when it's uh, when I'm on a video conference. Does that mean it's time for another question? Yes. <laughs> well, I've got another question. Other people can get ready with one in case there's another pause. <laughs> I'm just wondering, are there some examples of commercial applications of Compass? Mm. That's a very good question. I, I don't really know if there are examples of commercial applications. We make an effort to make this possible with the, with the permissive licensing. Um, I know that there are ongoing uh, projects for doing commercial uh, applications based on Compass, but I'm but I know that I'm not. Uh, they are still under. Uh, they're not yet public, so I cannot really talk about them. Um, I'm not really sure. Sorry, I. I can point to examples in academia of the project, but uh, not so much commercial ones, not yet at least. Uh, okay, now the robot loaded and I can connect it to this massive component here and I have the robot here. Um, that's not, that's okay, but not fantastic because it's not doing anything. So let's do the, uh, hello world of robotics. We're going to move the, the robot to follow a point. Um, so I put a point here. 
in the xy plane. Okay, so I want the robot to move there. Um, for that, I need inverse kinematics. If you're interested at some other point, I can talk about compass hub in detail. There's a there's a lot to discuss about it, but it wouldn't fit today. Um, Okay, good. Okay. Uh, why do I have the wrong plane? <laughs> okay, I chose, I chose the wrong, wrong plane, but it doesn't matter. Now, uh, every time I move the point, I'm getting a new IK, a new inverse kinematic solution for the robot, and the thing is visualizing. Um, this, which is it's a relatively simple, uh, simple example, involves a lot of moving parts. What what we just did, if this loads, what we just did was uh, we were using Rhino as a user. And we wanted to use a robot defined in ROS. ROS being a Linux tool means that we were running it in Docker. Docker was running uh, multiple containers for starting ROS plus like it starts a ROS uh, core coordinator. And then we didn't do this because we were not controlling it, but we started a bridge uh, like a well sockets bridge. And we started the moving motion applying framework um, the communication is done over Python with a library called Raspberry Pi that it's also open source that we published um, two years ago or three, I don't remember. Um, so everything was coming together in the Rhino user interface um, to show that. And with that, I would say thank you very much. And now it's like really time for questions. That's great. Thank you, Gonzalo. I've used up two of my questions. Who's got a question? Uh, Gonzalo? Yep. Uh, well, uh, Rafael here. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I just have uh, one question. And, uh, ah, before that, you know that in this forum uh, there are an, uh, there is a thread uh, dedicated to Sverdshock, and uh, if you write there, you will find uh, Niki Tronka is, is the leader of that project. So you can ask for uh, help or any information that you need. Uh, uh, and my question is, what what about um, support for FreeCAD? Uh, I don't know if you are aware that uh, FreeCAD has a uh, robot model, uh, has a uh, um, CNC model, 3D printer model, and as well BIM model. Uh, uh, maybe there is some room there to, you know, to uh, add support for uh, FreeCAD in, in, in Compass. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, it's a very good question. The, um, uh, there is very primitive support for FreeCAD already. Uh, I didn't mention it because it's very, 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 very uh, prototypical, let's say. But the idea is to go there. There's um, the first focus will actually be to integrate Open Cascade uh, with this Python OCCT, OCC or OCCT project. Um, which is also used by FreeCAD, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and slowly integrate more. As as mentioned, I, um, basically uh, the answer of Duncan's uh, question of how many we are, 
we are we are not that many, so we we move as fast as we can, but with the limited resources that we also have. So uh, we'll we'll get there basically. <laughs> Okay, there's no shortage of things to do. What other questions do we have? Hi, yeah, Jakob here from, from, uh, from Aachen University. Uh, thanks for this awesome contribution. Um, I see also that Ryan Schultz has uh, uh, raised his Jitsi hand. Uh, but I Sorry, Ryan, I'll try and keep a better, a better eye on that. Okay, no, no, no. So, so thanks for the contribution. That's really awesome. Um, I, I especially like, um, I'm especially delighted by the, the mappings or the integration of, um, of uh, external libraries of the extensive list of plugins that you have, of uh, that, it, which includes uh, beasts, uh, uh, really like CGEL, um, uh, the net polyhedron based uh, boolean operation stuff because we yeah there's there's always a shortage of, of this kinds of things how do you see um that is there any long-term uh, plans uh, applying for funding on a european level or to uh, to, to to keep this thing going because it, it, it uh, yeah it, it asks a, a quite a lot of work of course uh, to keep this up and running is there um are there any any plans of uh Mm -hmm. of, a of a longer lifetime yeah uh, i guess I'll, I'll also answer to lucas's uh, question just now we're asking if resources means academic funding um resources i actually meant more like human um, coding power but uh, it also means that if we have more funding uh, we would have more resources in terms of long-term um funding the um, well the short answer is yes the plan is to uh, to outlive the funding scheme of 12 years of the nccr and it, it, it's not just a plan it's it's part of what we are actually reviewed on by the panel the the review panel of the of the nccr will basically rate us on transfer for the last phase and the transfer for the compass is um, is moving to a to a, to a community driven. I mean, we usually call this community driven approach, and in fact, it's um, probably going to be a foundation or something that will steer the the project, as mostly any other open source project is doing these days. With the with the effective funding coming, perhaps from academia still but not necessarily. I don't know if that answers the question. Thank you. So, so I mean, w w one, of the, one of the possibilities, and, and that was also asked by Duncan before, is to get industry backing. Um, so, so 10 years ago, uh, Leon from Barrow and, and, and I, we funded uh, BIMServer.org, um, and, and Leon uh, from Barrow made, made a tremendous effort to get always get some funding from somewhere to pay Ruben de Laat and other developers who really dedicated uh, uh, so much time to this uh, project. So it, it really takes quite a lot of organization to, to keep this alive and uh, uh, keep this funded. So I, I really, um, I, I really hope that this, uh, that this uh, continues to live on and that you get some, so other, so, so apart from the simulation part, huh, uh, is there also, is there, do you also bridge into the hardware? So do you have any, um, um, what are the connectors to, to let's say somebody, somebody uh, robot uh, vendors? Yeah, um, which actually matches the question that Sasha is just asking right now. Yeah. Great timing. <laughs> um, we are, as a team in particular, and now I'm talking about the, the Gramatio Color Research team, we are very much um, demonstration oriented. So it's this is not research in, in the air. Um, everything executes on real hardware. 
uh, most of my uh, of, of our hardware sorry it's a uh, avp manipulators that's why we work on compass rc um which is sasha's question um compass rc is a driver that we develop um in parallel to a driver that exists for ROS, um, because the driver was just not featureful enough uh, for our needs. We, we've been developing for a number of years already, two years, um, so far in private, but we are very close to open sourcing this, um, like really, really close. We're like, ideally it should happen in March, basically this month but um it will be initially open sourced uh rrc is composed by three different packages one is a ROS driver like a ROS, um uh, yeah generic translator you could say uh, the other one is a python client site and the last one is rapid code for avb robots uh, the ROS driver and the Python interface will be completely open source. The rapid part will be uh, will be free for academic use and will have a license for commercial usage. If I'm not mistaken, I don't take my work for granted here because this goes through a few layers. Um, but this should this should happen really really soon. Uh, also we we intend to work on we also have a lot of ur robots uh, that we use for teaching teaching is also perhaps something that i should highlight we we publish all the um, or almost all the courses that we do for compass they are published uh, on github with a with an with a either creative commons or mit licenses so there's a lot of examples out there um and yeah the next step for rrc would be to support ur robots and we will see like we have the choice of using ROS drivers as well like for many of these manipulators and for ur the the situation is a bit um um we're a bit undecided because there is an well, not so new anymore, but relatively new driver that it's actually built by UR for us. Uh, but it it requires um, it requires a lot of a, a lot of careful um, setup for, from the uh, operator. It's um, Maybe I should have included some features of this, but uh, in in the in the in the spectrum of control types for robots, from offline like traditional robotic programming that you upload the code to the controller and you forget about it, and on the other side the like full real time online control, we are in the middle for our like desired ideal format. It's it's um. It's online control that what we what we do, but it's non real time, in real time in the sense of like the roboticists real time, you know the hard uh, time guarantees that no cycle can exceed I don't know a few milliseconds. Um, the the control that we do has to be has to feel that it's like real time, but it does it's not. Um, it's not limited by these strong guarantees. The driver from UR, on the other hand, <clears throat> is a traditional robotics driver in that sense. It needs full real-time guarantees. That means that you need to have a dedicated Linux machine that needs to have the real-time kernel patch on it. So it's it, it starts being very... It goes very much away from the comfort zone of a a designer or an architect and it begins to take a, quite a, quite some effort to to manipulate the robot that, that it's actually intended to be easy to operate <laughs> uh, so in that sense we are considering we, whether we should anyway develop 
uh, no, no, a compass RC for URs, despite the fact that the open source community has a driver for it. And other vendors, um, we we don't have the hardware <laughs> to test them on. <laughs> Uh, there is always talks about supporting KUKA robots, of course. And uh, I guess the first time that we have a project that requires a KUKA robot, we will develop something for it if the existing interfaces don't, don't support it. We, we have Stoibri robots, actually, also. And for that, we use the ROS driver because it works well enough. So if anyone's got a spare KUKA uh, robot that they're not using, there's somewhere yeah. you can send it to. You'll pay the shipping, right? Well, we're, we're doing everything remote these days, so we don't even need to ship it, right? <laughs> of course. So somebody just needs to have space in their basement to set it up. Yeah. Did that answer your question, Sasha? Otherwise, let us know. Can I, can I have a question also? I mean. Um... Is this only applicable for uh, robots or only also for, uh, for example, 3D printing or, uh, you know, for uh, smaller mechanical parts uh, and stuff like that? Um, yeah. it's, also, it's also applicable for 3D printing. We use RRC for, for, um, for large concrete 3D printing. Uh, I can show you maybe one example. Concrete. Let me share my screen again. Hello? Yeah, sorry. Uh, I lost my screen. There we go. Okay, do you see my screen now? Yes. Oh, well, I ended up in Facebook, sorry. <laughs> but this, uh, this large concrete columns were, were 3D printed with, um, with RRC, for example. This is, this is the, the, the robotic hull using RRC for printing. Okay. Cool. We're getting up to about an hour there. If, um, are there some other questions? And while people are thinking about that, um, we've talked a lot about uh, fabrication from different CAD platforms moving to fabrication. Um, and, and Compass can do other things as well. There's tons of stuff here that I don't quite understand. <laughs> so my question is basically, can you say something about how Compass and Speckle are similar and dissimilar? Yeah, um, we we are we're trying to. Actually, Matteo is here, right? Or maybe he left already. We're, yeah, he just left. Uh, yeah, we're trying to we're trying to connect the two because they are um, Speckle is is focused on another area that we're not focusing. So it would be great to be able to combine them. Um, we know, for example, people are already using Speckle and Compass uh, together for doing robot control. I, I think uh, the, the group in Princeton, the, the Stefana Parasho, uh, for instance, she's doing some, some experiments to do robotic control using speckle as the transport layer, for example. 
Um, and we're in discussions with them to find like how exactly we could make it, uh, make it, it how, what's the best way to combine the two? Great. Because we, we, we are at least, um, at least we are very much aligned in our value systems. And that's, uh, if we, if we can combine the applications, that would be awesome. Great. Well, unless somebody has another question, I'm um, I'm just going to say thank you very much. It's a great presentation. Now we uh, all have some kind of understanding of what Compass is, and we can tell people about it and drop it into conversations. <laughs> thank you very much for for having me. And yeah, I'm I'm around uh, any any time in in the forum if there are questions. So just.